Uh, so this talk, Hustle and Flow, is about how we model asynchronous systems. Um, and I'm old enough, as you can tell by the grey of my beard, to have been lucky to work in uh, pre-automation offices, so before we had uh, ubiquitous computing. And one of the early jobs that I was involved in was the automation of those offices and moving from paper-based workflows into um, uh, automation. And I think that uh, gave some of us insights into how asynchronous processes work because they were all asynchronous at that time. Um, that is even today reflected in the names of common patterns we use in messaging spaces like routing slips. And so really this talk is a little bit about how we can better model um, our flows by understanding how, what we can learn from those paper-based systems. Um, this is about me. Um, it's mostly dull. It says I'm old. Uh, the final point I, is the one I always call out as more important. It's very easy to think of these things as kind of expert to learner by the power and balance of me up being up here and you being down there. But smartness is not effectively a you know constrained resource. We're all perfectly capable, and I encourage you to share everything that you have with other people as well. Um, Briefly, I work on an open source project if you're in the .NET space. Um, uh, it's a messaging uh, framework. Uh, we welcome new uh, users and we also welcome new contributors. Okay, what are we gonna talk about? I'm just gonna briefly talk about synchronous and asynchronous conversations, what we mean by that, and just ensure that we're all on the same page. We'll then look at the reason why it's important for people to focus on modeling processes and not entities, um, and, and why this gets people into difficulty. We'll then look at the kind of heart of this talk, which is how thinking about paper-based workflows can sometimes help us to do that exercise of uh, modeling the processes that we have without essentially the concerns of technology distracting us. I'll look a little bit at how we tend to then think about event storming exercises when I run them in order to try and facilitate that insight. If we have time, I'm conscious a little bit, there's a lot of material and we're only on 50 minutes. If we have time, we'll talk a little bit about an idea called flow-based programming um, and how that really kind of can uh, help us understand how to apply these things at a technical level. So there are two types of conversations we tend to have. In the first type of conversation, a synchronous conversation, both parties need to be present for the communication to succeed. Typically, that's something like a phone call or GRPC. Okay. Synchronous conversations are often a problem because of that requirement called temporal coupling that both parties be present at the same time. I don't know about you, but the only people that really phone me on a regular basis are my mum and my wife. The only people that actually really want to hear my voice. Everybody else does something else, right? And they have an asynchronous conversation with me. So in an asynchronous conversation, the receiver does not need to be present at the same time as the sender, and we use some kind of message box to do store and forward, right? I send you, send you a message, it's stored, and you can retrieve it when you are when you're able to. We do this all the time, right? Snail mail, today, we all probably are on things like Slack, Instant Messenger, Teams, the pandemic has only kind of pushed that forward. And in terms of messaging systems, you think of things like Kafka, right? And what this enables is us to have uh, services that are independent of each other in time, right? They are no longer temporarily coupled. And it also improves our ability in a tendency to independent deployability because the types of conversation we tend to have when we are asynchronous tend to be ones where we effectively give you the information you need to go and do some work and make a decision and then come back with the answer. So they tend to scale better. And many of us may have discovered that our organizations became remote in the pandemic, but didn't understand how to do remote working because generally they didn't understand that they need to be asynchronous when they work, resulting in an escalation of the number of meetings that we have. Okay. So a typical problem that I tend to encounter is that uh, when people do uh, break up their system into microservices, they tend to model entities or aggregates even and not processes. 
So this is a typical kind of model that I might see, right? We have a whole load of services that are wrapped around ideas. So I work currently for Just Eat Takeaway. So the space I work in is online food delivery. And so this is kind of stuff we, ha we think about in our domain. And people start to come up with ideas like, hey, we should build an order service. And that will do the crud for an order, right? It will manage the lifetime of an order, they say, right? We'll do the same for a restaurant or a menu or a customer. And we have all these entities wrapped in usually some kind of REST API that really were just saying, hey, get an order, um, put, put an order, et cetera. And the problem with that is that's not the logic of what we do. So the logic of what we then do then tends to drift outside and people build something they usually call an orchestrator, which actually contains the, the actual domain logic. Sometimes it's the first service in the chain that ends up with the domain logic and kind of acts as the orchestrator instead in this diagram. But generally all that happens is that orchestrator then just calls these services to get work done. And the problem with that is really all we've done is just wrap access to a database table in a REST API. And if our database actually exposes a REST API like DynamoDB or something like that, then what was the point? We really ended up with just a distributed monolith, right? We've made the situation worse in a way because now we're just paying all this cost for effectively wrapping all these separate entities. Um, but our workflow is still in one single centralized location and suffers from the problems that effectively we have multiple teams trying to adjust this single orchestration. And what we want is something that looks like this, where effectively we figure out what the processes are that we need to deliver with, and we model those. So here, a typical flow in my kind of space would be, you know, somebody orders food, we take some kind of payment for it, we then essentially have to try and place that order with a restaurant and with a courier, and we kind of confirm that order back to the customer, right? This is a very simplistic version of that diagram. But you can see that only a limited amount of that actually then tends to need to be synchronous. The payment taking is quite often a synchronous conversation, right? We may be using async keywords and handover control of our thread, et cetera. That's not an asynchronous conversation, right? That's just us basically optimizing our use of threads on a machine. Um, the synchronous conversation exists because we have to block to get that work done, right? But the other pieces of work are quite clear handoffs, right? Once you've ordered your food, you don't really sit there going, uh, I expect to be watching every step of the process, right? What happens is we say, okay, we'll send you a message when the kitchen starts cooking your order. We'll send you a message, right? It's an asynchronous flow that's happening. We're able to capture the asynchronous flow. But we start to think about processes instead of entities. And this is what microservices is, not the other diagram, which is just a bit of monolith. Right. But the problem I see a lot, sorry, uh, just on the other thing there, um, this idea of information packets flowing through processes that give behavior um, was uh, identified in the 1970s, and it's called flow-based programming. We may talk a little bit about flow-based programming at the, at the end, but if not, it's an interesting one to look up. Um, predates even like functional programming as an alternative to OO, and it saw effectively this idea of saying you have components that have behavior, and you have state, which is in an information pack which flows through the system, and that flow is what we are kind of trying to seek. But, but what, the problem seems to be that when you talk to people, they find it much easier to think about modeling entities. They struggle to think about capturing processes and how they work. So I began to wonder if actually what we needed to do was take technology out of the equation when we asked people to model. The classic problem, and we'll talk about this later when we get to event storming a bit more, but the classic problem I get whenever I run an event storming session is people say things like, well, what do we mean by an event? Is that like something when we've raised an event on Kafka, right? Uh, and they want to apply technology very early on. So let's take their technology out of the equation, right? Let's imagine we're going to model things as paper. And we have quite a lot of knowledge about how that 
that used to work, right? So let's imagine that I want to run a entirely paper-based version of my current business. We're going to call it just paper takeaway, uh, to, be, to be very original. Um, uh, and what we're going to do is send catalogs to customers' houses through their mailbox. Customers will look through the catalog for what they want to order. They will phone us up. They will place an order. We will fax that to a restaurant. The restaurant will cook it and deliver it to the customer's house. Right? And we'll do everything in a paper-based telephone, 1970s style. Right? We can even have disco music on while we're doing it if we like. And... Um, what we'll do basically is that we'll look at the first step. So the first step is to sign up a restaurant, right, and add them to our catalog. And this is a value stream map, for those of you who haven't seen it, and it really just says we can think of there being three processes, but I'll show you kind of how we, we think about that in a bit more detail. But there are three processes here, basically. An onboarding inquiry, managing of a menu, and publishing a catalog. The box underneath represents the kind of departments or teams that deal with it. And we then talk a little bit about uh, LT and PT. LT is lead time, how long it would take somebody to actually get to the work in the queue. PT is processing time, how it takes them to process the request once they receive it. And the figure at the bottom is how many tend to succeed, right? Now, that's just interesting. You don't really need to do that in most cases for any kind of modeling um, that you're doing. But it's interesting to understand uh, where value stream maps come from. OK. Because I'm aware that some of you are younger than me and, you, and you've never seen a pre-automation office, here's a few pictures to help you with. So on the left is how you used to work, right? You had a desk, and on your desk was your out tray and your in tray. So work you needed to do lands in your inbox, in your in tray, right? That big stack of files. You take it onto your desk, and in your desk you are very, you are busy. You've got a telephone, right? And then when you've done work, you put it in your out tray, and it gets taken away, right? Work coming into the inbox is coming in asynchronously and is queued. When you put work in the outbox, you are queuing it effectively for delivery to something else. So those are asynchronous conversations that you are having. If you pick up the phone to call somebody, you are effectively needing to be synchronous. You are busy doing something, and you need some kind of synchronous interaction to satisfy the request that you're currently working on. All right. So mail arrives in your inbox from this mail cart, and then mail is taken from your outbox by the mail cart. Someone's job is to push around a mail cart. I've done that job. We'll call this guy Franz, Franz Kafka, and we'll say he's basically pushing our mail cart around our business. Typically, you see two kind of things in your mailbox. You get one of these little skinny envelopes. It's usually a request for action, right? Uh, typically a memo or a single page of document, right? It's discrete and immediately action. We can think about them as typically being commands in a messaging system. Um, and typically, they're best seen as working over queues, right? So queues are things like RabbitMQ or SNS and SQS in AWS. And they have the characteristic that effectively work is queued. You take it off the work, and it's actually deleted when you act it, right? So in other words, I remove work from the queue, and it's done, right? We also have streams, so generally that's files on the, other, on, the, on the far side. Essentially, they're the things that we need to support action. So typically in a paper office, I get some re request that says, can you update this for this customer? And I need to have the customer's file. The customer's file gives me the data that I need in order to actually work on that request. Right? And typically, this tends to be the stuff we transmit by streams. It's often serial. It supports action. Right? and they tend to be events or documents. Okay. There's a whole bigger topic about queues versus streams, but we don't have time to cover that today, but I, I will uh, try and talk about that at a conference at some point. All right, this is our equivalent of a broker. When I used to work in a mail room, this was called the frame. I, my first ever job was in a mail room. I've been, me I've been messaging all my life, really. Um, and you basically, it's a bit, this is just like a Kafka broker, right? We just sort the mail into the various topics and it gets delivered to the various floors. This is a fax machine. I, I realize that not everyone has seen a fax machine, um, but it's effectively we can send documents asynchronously, right? OK. So here's how a typical flow in our paper-based business might work. A restaurant says, we need to sign up for Just Paper Takeaway. All of our competitors are doing that, and they're getting lots of business. I'm going to phone up their sales team and place an order. So there's a synchronous conversation that initiates this, right? Our sales team, I mean, in reality, what may happen is they 
send us some kind of onboarding inquiry and we then phone them back. But um, our sales team effectively listen to that call and they say, great, we'll make an agreement to sign you up. When they've signed up the customer, they probably open a file on their desk for this new customer. And then they say, okay, in my outbox, I'm gonna put a request for someone to take their menu details. Franz Kafka comes along and he picks it up and he takes it away and he puts it in the inbox of a team whose job is to effectively manage our menus. And the managed menu team take it out of the inbox and they say, you better contact the restaurant. So they open a file saying, okay, we to need to contact the restaurant. Um, uh, and they put basically, a, write up a request and they fax it over to the restaurant. Meanwhile, then I'm getting on with other work, right? Pres presumably faxing other restaurants. Admin team over in the restaurant, they're, effectively the fax machine is their inbox. They take the fax out, they figure out who it's for, they validate it, and they put a request in their outbox to go to the chef. Whoever the Franz Kafka equivalent is over in the restaurant takes it down to the chef, and the chef says, okay, what menu are we going to make available online? Figures out what he thinks is a reasonable and profitable menu to, to create, uh, writes it down, puts that in his outbox. Their Franz Kafka equivalent comes over, takes it from the outbox, right? Takes it to the admin team, who, put, who arrives in their inbox, and they fax it back to us. Fax comes back to us, we open up the file, and we say, great, we've got a response to that one. Generally, what's happened is we have something like a reference, right? Where it says, your ref, on the top of the letter, so we can look up the file on our desk that tells us who this belonged to. We think of that in messaging that as a correlation ID, right? I received this response asynchronously and in a different time, so I need to look up what work it was for. Notice that where I talk about opening a file, it implies that these people have some kind of storage. That's not always true. And in fact, in some cases, we may want to look at some of these, the way we used to do asynchronous flows, to realize we don't need to have storage some of our processes. But in this case, I've got a file, I've stored some saying I've got work in progress, so effectively I can recover if it, if it never happens, right? At some point I may get a reminder saying, doesn't seem that this person's replied with their menu. But having got the menu, I can say, great, I can fill out, fill out the relevant paperwork and send it across to our team that creates menus. Team that creates menus gets that in their inbox and they publish a new menu. And I'm aligning some reprographics department that's producing that. Okay, the menu that we've just produced is going to be important to us when we think about how we do um, uh, messaging in the next phase. All right. This is a routing slip. Who's heard of the routing slip pattern in messaging? A few of you? Uh, how many of those of you have actually seen what a physical routing slip looks like before in your life? Okay, just less of you. So this is a routing slip, and what literally you did, you attached this to the front of a given memo or a file, and the R, I, and A indicate what you should do, right? I indicates it's information only. In other words, it's an event as far as you're concerned. You receive an event, you are informed that something has happened, but there is no work for you to do. A is an action. It says you are being sent this as a command because you have action to do in this workflow. And R, retain, indicates that you are the person effectively who needs to store this result on file. All right. So that's how we can do simple workflows in messaging by effectively attaching the workflow to the messages it flows through the system and indicating what you need to do with it. All right, so the customer wants to place an order with us. So the customer is going to phone up a customer agent. The customer agent is basically going to take their food order and it's going to pass it over to the finance team to take the payment. We're then going to place the order with a, with a restaurant and then we're going to confirm the order. All right. So we've published this catalog, and that means that the consumer can now make an order from us, right? Who's read a paper by Pat Helen called Data on the Outside versus Data on the Inside? Anyone? It's a great paper, you should read it. One of the things Pat talks about is that services have data inside that effectively they own. That belongs to me, nobody else gets to touch it, its schema is private and it's mine. And I have data on the outside, stuff that I publish in messages or in responses to get requests, all right? And we can cache that outside data locally somewhere else, right? It's information we can use. And so what we're doing here is preventing the need for the customer to phone the restaurant and ask them, what food is it that you have? 
right? That would be a really annoying process, right? We had to do that, and we had to say, hey, can you tell me what your menu is? Great, I'm just going to write that down. OK, now I'm going to make my order, right? That would be slow, and it would be irritating. So we publish it ahead of time. Yet too often in services, we don't understand that. And what we actually do is say, well, at this point, you're going to ask the restaurant what they, what they provide. Don't do that. What you do is effectively you create a stream from a system of its outside data and you collate it locally to you and you use that to provide choices to the user for selection or effectively to inform it on how you do your busy work. Right? So similarly, when they place an order with us, they phone us up and place up an order team, we have to check the order. Now if you're like my household, you get you know, flyers from restaurants and you shove them in a drawer. And then when you want to order, you pull out one from the drawer. And generally, one of the problems is that yours is three months old and out of date, and you throw away the new one, right? So one of the first things, problems we have to deal with is eventual consistency, right? It may be that the customer is actually ordering with an old set of reference data that's out of, that out of time. Doesn't matter. Our order team just basically figure out what it actually costs and tells them that these items are not available because they have a current version of the catalog. And note that both my order team and the customer can use this notion of a lookup piece of data to do their work, right? They get published outside data, which they collect locally, which they use to do the validation. They don't phone the restaurant and ask the restaurant effectively what the current prices are and what's available every single time a customer places an order. That would be madness. And yet again, in too many of our microservices, what happens is when we want to validate an order, we talk to the restaurant entity and say, Hey, what's the what's the what's the, pri what's the prices on your menu, right? Okay. So having placed that order, generally what would tend to happen is that I need to take payment. Often we would just transfer them on the phone system to another team who basically take a present, uh, take, take a, do a cardholder not present transaction where they essentially take your credit card details and swipe your card and effectively take a payment for your order, right? The transaction is synchronous as far as the end user is concerned because they block, it's a synchronous conversation, but it's asynchronous from the point of view of the order taking team. We've handed the work off and can go and answer the phone to another customer while someone deals with the process of effectively talking to the credit card company to validate your payment. Okay. And at the end of that, the order payment team can place a thing in their outbox that says, we have an order. All right. This is a typical kind of asynchronous flow used in restaurants. It's called the order wheel. What happens is the waitress comes along and puts your order on the wheel. The wheel is then turned by the staff effectively, so it's basically your, you know, your event stream, right? To pull, uh, so that the, they can pull the, an order off in the kitchen and then cook it, right? We use these things all the time. Right? Okay, so order placement. So order placement, they receive the order into their inbox and they say, great, we need to fax the order to the restaurant. They open a file because these things can go wrong, right? So they open a file so that they've got a copy saying that there is an order and they write a reference number for the order on it and they send fax it across to the restaurant. The restaurant's team pick it out of their fax machine and they say, this needs to go to the chef. So they put it in their outbox and, the out and, the, and Franz Kafka takes it over to the chef. The chef takes it out of his inbox and the chef says, okay, I have some work to do. I need to figure out if we have the ingredients necessary to cook the order. I need to figure out if we have the capacity to cook the order. And if I do think we can do the order, what I then do is I put a message in my outbox to go to the driver booking team. And the driver booking team then get a message saying, can you book a driver for this order and when can you book it for? So the driver team phones up their, uh, the restaurant owner's cousin, Dave, and Dave says, well, the football finishes at 7.45, so I can probably start delivering orders about eight. So they then say, they put a message back to the chef saying, yes, we can deliver. We can start deliveries at eight, right? So the chef then knows I should start cooking depending for, for pickup at eight, depending on how long it takes me to cook this food. One of the biggest problems in my industry is delivering food hot because you don't want cold food. So to do that, we have to essentially estimate how long it will take to deliver to you and how long it takes to cook, right? So the driver basically puts something back in their outbox, which goes back to the chef, and it also goes to the admin team, who then fax back, basically, take that out of their inbox, and fax back that response to our order uh, placement team. 
the order placement team take that fax response out of their inbox. They open the file for that order and they say, great, this order's been fulfilled. And then they effectively put a message in their outbox saying the order's been fulfilled. Okay. And what the hand then happens is that Franz Kafka takes the message from their outbox, wanders over to basically some kind of customer care team, puts it in their inbox. They take it out of their inbox and they phone the customer and they say, great, we have your order in the kitchen and the food will be delivered to you at half eight tonight. And what I want you to see is that a number of parts of this process are looking at the bottom where we hustle, right? Someone's doing some work at their desk. They are figuring out whether, they, whether the restaurant can cook that food. They are figuring out basically um, you know, how to basically put your, your, your menu details into our format to, to publish it. But at other places we have flow, right? Where essentially messages are carrying the work between process steps. No entity models, right? So, I know it's hard to read this diagram, don't worry about the detail. What I want you to see is the, is the kind of difference. So here, we have an initiation, the process with a synchronous conversation between the restaurant and our sales team. We then asynchronously tell, them, tell our menu uh, ma management team to process their menu. We asynchronously ask the restaurant to send us the menu. The restaurant asynchronously fills in the menu and sends it back to us. We then asynchronously tell our team that basically produces the menu to produce the menu. They asynchronously publish that out basically to both the customer and to our, automa and, and to our customer team. The customer team, when they receive a synchronous order, can use that asynchronous publication to look up the details that they need. And having confirmed the order, we essentially, although the customer sees it as a synchronous Synchronous conversation can asynchronously deal with payment. Okay. Having taken the payment, we can then asynchronously send it to the order placement team who asynchronously contact the restaurant. The restaurant asynchronously tells the chef to confirm the order, who asynchronously passes it over to the driver who is booked, who asynchronously tells the restaurant the, the chef when to cook and confirms the order back to our team, who asynchronously basically effectively raise an order confirmation, who asynchronously tell the customer care team to contact the customer and tell them that their food is, is due, who synchronously contact the customer. Most of this flow is an asynchronous conversation, and that happens because we are dealing with process steps and not dealing with entities. Okay. And that is, in my experience, if you want to succeed with asynchronous flows between services, that you need to focus on trying to identify what the processes are, the things with these clear handoffs between some work comes into my inbox, I'm busy, I'm doing synchronous things, the work is done, my, 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 my patent is done, I put the work in my outbox, right? And it flows onto somebody else. And those processes are what you're running to think about modeling, not entities. How about errors, Ian? Um, this is a error log from a fax. Has anyone actually uh, seen an error a log from a fax machine? Is anyone old enough like me to see that? A few of you, a few of you are not that young. Right, so, okay. So what happens, you can send a fax and you can er get an error saying, hey, that fax didn't send. What do we do in that case? All right, so our team is effectively placing an order with a restaurant. What they may find is that essentially they get, I'll just show you the whole, diagram, I think, um, uh, an error back from the fax machine. But remember, we said they open a file, and in that file, essentially, they record the fact that basically they have an ongoing order with a restaurant. And one of the things they tend to do in this model is effectively keep a copy of the message that they send to the restaurant. So it uses, I think I'll show you the picture in a second, a carbon copy, right? So you write on the top, and effectively you get an imprint on a sheet of carbon paper underneath, and you file that sheet of carbon paper. So in the event that you need to resend the message because the restaurant lost it, you easily can. Now in the case of a fax machine, you can probably keep the original and resend it, right? And we do that in messaging today. We just call it the outbox pattern, right? 
where we effectively say in order for, to achieve transactional correctness, when we send a message that relates to a change to an upstream entity, we put that in a transaction with the upstream entity in an outbox because we can't transact to the message queue. And then effectively, we mark that message as dispatched basically in the outbox table when it has been sent or else we resend it uh, through a given amount of time has passed. And exactly the same process as how we used to work asynchronously, right? Similar, so this is basically a memo with a carbon copy underneath. And that's what that CC, for those of you that are too young to know, that's what the CC line means in an email, carbon copy. That refers to that copy slip underneath. Similarly, uh, with the sales team, right? When the sales team effectively open that file and tell our team to basically, uh, they want to contact the restaurant basically in order to get the menu details, if there's no contact with the restaurant, and effectively, the sales team at a certain point, either because the restaurant contacts them to say, hey, we didn't get anyone talk asking us about our menu, or because the sales team effectively don't receive any confirmation that that actual restaurant is now onboarded to our system, they simply resend the work. Right? Because they've stored the work, the message that they intend to send. In the event of failure, they just resend it. And that's a strategy we use all the time in messaging systems. Um, if a transaction is declined here, it's a bit of a complicated flow, but if you look down here, right, what we're showing is the customer's basically placed the order with our order placement team who've transferred it over the internal phone network to the payments team and trying to take a payment, and the payment's failed, a card declined, right? A simple process here is effectively to contact the customer and to say to them, please give us another card. So it's just a retry operation. And all of these are just flows, right? People often wonder about what happens in the event of errors. Do I need transactions, et cetera? And the answer is that we never had transactions. But we functioned. And we functioned because we just used, treated errors as a separate flow. All right, some practical advice. Um, uh, when I do event storming, I won't tell you what event storming is. I assume this audience understands, right? Um, I tend to nowadays say to people, let's, when people say, what are we modeling? Are we modeling some future state, perfect system, existing systems we have, what technology? I say, let's just model this as though it's a paper-based system we were using to provide this. Okay. Um, and a, what's an event? It's just a memo you put in your outbox for somebody, right? What's a command? It's just something that's going to kick off a workflow, right? I tend to focus not on aggregates anymore, but on processes. My problem with aggregate is just basically an entity with some transactional semantics around it or a collection of them. And that tends to, unfortunately, for my mind, begin to make people focus on modeling uh, entities. And I don't want you to model entities because that leads us effectively to entity-based microservices, et cetera. Right? What I want you to do is model processes. So I shift the focus a little bit to say that what transforms things is a process. And then we can think about the views that we commonly have as these kind of catalogs that we publish as lookup data, right? So typically, then, you might end up with something that's a bit small to read, but this is restaurant signed up, many details, and restaurant catalog updated as events. And then, effectively, we see processes flowing in between them. For example, managed catalog, um, uh, uh, order restaurant details, and agree contract, right? Similarly, for customer order, which you saw, the key events would be that the um, restaurant catalog is updated, that basically an order is taken, and an order is basically then raised, right? And again, there are processes like take order and take payment, and you can see that we're using a view of the um, uh, uh, restaurant catalog, the menu effectively, using basically a uh, restaurant uh, catalog updated or menu updated event to fill it. And you can see here, for example, on order placement, where we, the key events would be that an order is raised and an order is placed, we've really got a place order process, right? And in fact, to an order confirmation, where we're talking about order placed and order confirmed, we've obviously got some kind of confirm order process. And that tends to, I find, move us away from talking about technology, because I've taken technology away from you. About the most sophisticated technology I'm going to let you have is a telephone uh, and an outbox and Franz Kafka the mail cart. Never forget Franz Kafka the mail cart, right? All right. So, what does that kind of mean technically when you want to try and implement some of this stuff? 
So I'd argue that in the web services kind of era of SOA, we were very much stuck in this model of entity-based services, right? That typically we saw services quite often as, you know, we're just breaking up our data tables and wrapping basically APIs over them and spreading them around. And that led to basically the decline of SOA in the hell of an enterprise service bus with all of the workflows captured inside it because we just had distributed monoliths. What we want to do is learn a bit more from this kind of idea, which is called flow-based programming. So this is basically J. Paul Morrison in the 1970s, an alternative to object orientation, he created flow-based programming. So flow-based programming says that what in OO, OO says basically there is behavior and there is state, and we want to co-locate behavior with the state that essentially that behavior manipulates. We want to hide that state from users and just expose the behavior. Flow-based programming says we want to separate behavior and state. State flows through the system. And components provide behavior that transforms state. So here you can see we've got a component in gray that owns behavior. Off to its uh, left-hand side, you can see the little pink rectangle. That basically is what's called an information packet in flow-based programming, and essentially it contains state. Generally in flow-based programming, that flows into your component via an abstraction called a port, right? You can think of that really in modern terms as a topic, right? In a modern uh, messaging middleware, right? And it's over a connector. And generally, in the flow-based programming model, most of the connectors were queues in the sense that, effectively, when you, when, you, when you acknowledged an item, an information packet that you were reading, it was deleted, such that, effectively, you couldn't reprocess it. Um, uh, and you generally only do a deletion when you effectively process the behavior. You act to say, OK, I am going to basically act to delete that one, and I'm going to raise a message on the outgoing uh, connector so that basically I then get that flow right across between the two. Okay. So this would be, in flow-based programming terms, how something like that onboard restaurant works. So what happens is we, ha we treat in flow-based programming, we treat a UI as a stream of information packets being raised by a customer. So in this case, effectively, uh, the stream is details about the restaurant coming in. We would then basically pass that information packet to a, um, a process that effectively says we want to, I don't know, qualify the restaurant. We want to determine actually this is a restaurant we do want to sign up. We want to make sure, you know, um, they've passed their food standard hygiene checks. And we want to ch check that basically they're not some sort of dodgy money laundering affair, right? And then effectively, we would put that into our, onto our outport. It travels over a connector as an information packet to our uh, restaurant details process. That takes basically that information packet off it effectively, and then we want to basically uh, send a fax to that restaurant, right? To get their information, we can put, you know, call a fax pragmatically. In order to do that effectively, we need to store something that says, well, we're going to do some long running piece of work now, so we're going to need to store this. We want to, igno to, to acknowledge the information packet is now read and that we're processing it, and that means if we fail at uh, this point, that work will be lost. So we need to store that work while we, while we do this asynchronous process of faxing you, right? So in order to basically do that, we need to create a correlation idea of some sort so that we can correlate the fax messages response back with a piece of work that we know is in flight, and we need to have storage. Now, flow-based programming effectively treats storage as a thing that you need or don't need, right? The first component, there's no implication that we actually need storage. The storage exists effectively on the messaging middleware that's being used to move work into our component. Okay. And then having got the fax response back, we can then effectively uh, create the menu catalog effectively and publish it, right? Then essentially when we order food, again, it's a stream coming from the customer to the, to the UI of information packets with their order in. That passes over to our take order system, which takes an order off, basically. It's in port, effectively. Once it's got that order, effectively, it needs to validate it. So it needs to do what uh, flow-based programming calls a lookup against a table, which is essentially just our model of reference data from Pat Helen's data on the outside. So it's the inside event carriage state transfer is how we often call 
do it now. An event character state transfer says some other source has been raising information packets and we have simply stored them in a table of current prices and menus for restaurant and we will look up that and validate it. Then the information packet flows out of our process onto our out pipe, and then effectively that becomes the in pipe for take payment. Take payment says, great, uh, we need to talk to a card reader. That's synchronous. What we can actually do is by putting that on a queue, we can keep the, the take payment system processing new work while we wait effectively for that synchronous response to complete. So we can effectively, if you like, layer async over sync. And the card reader process then effectively, again, because we're effectively saying, well, queue requests for basically the call to the, pay to the, to the payment system um, uh, and get responses back. We need to correlate it and we need to use storage, right? And then essentially, once we've taken the payment for it, we then create a new information packet that flows out that says we have basically a successful order that needs placement. And so effectively, you can see that we get these clusters of steps of work that between which are asynchronous. We get asynchronicity in many cases between them, and even where we have some kind of synchronous flow, we're in many cases able to layer async over the top. And that is effectively how you can build, um, using flow-based programming, asynchronous work around processes. So my argument is at this point that what we end up looking like is something like this, right? That no longer are we dealing with this kind of SOA world of modeling entities and wrapping interfaces around them. We should be dealing with a world where we model processes and have information packets flow in and out of them, carrying effectively the work that we want to do. All right. And I finished early, which is a bit of a surprise, but there you go. Um, uh, so there's probably time for a couple of questions if we want. But um, uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, you taking questions? Yeah, can do. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask? We're using the trophy. Uh, th th this person can throw a mic at you. Uh, but if you're in the top, I'd be amazed to see that. Is there anyone with a question? Trying to see in the lights. Right, Wave your hand lightly. <laughs> it doesn't have to be any questions. You can just. Someone pointing some I think someone's got wandering around with a mic. Do I speak to yeah. <laughs> so how do you properly know uh, what are the processes of your problem? Right. Okay, how do you find processes? So uh, there are a couple of ways of doing this, right? If you think about how you would you would do it using paper. Um, that's one way, right? But you might think, well, I could just imagine that, he does that this one person does everything at their desk, right? And, and that's possible, but that wouldn't scale, right? So you begin to think about how, can I how would you divide this up, right, into smaller pieces. And to divide something up, what you look for is handovers. Where has something been done which produces a result which can be handed to the next to somebody else to then do, such that this person can simply specialize on doing that task, right? And they can keep repeating it, because effectively, all they do when they've done that task, they don't switch context, they just put it in the outbox, take the next example of that task, and they do it, and let somebody else specialize in doing the other thing. So you're usually looking for handovers. We didn't talk, because I, I dropped the slides out, actually, because I was a bit worried about time, but um, value stream mapping. So how do you, how do, you do value stream mapping? Uh, generally, the advice basically for value stream mapping is the thing called go to the Gemba or walk the floor. So the idea is you, you try and figure out how the process would work. But that works in industry because there's physical things to go and see, right? But for us, it's a bit more conceptual, which is why I tend to talk about paper. But you're, what you try and do is figure out how would this work. You could even get in a room, right, and have pieces of paper and then try figuring out and have you know, inboxes and outboxes and try modeling that kind of flow to see how it fits. But you're looking for those handovers. Generally, for a given process, you are looking for somewhere between, I would say, three to eight sort of steps uh, as, as being normal in a process, a, a, a flow. Generally, there are two types of flows. There are operational flows and there are environmental flows. Operational flows are, I am providing a service to somebody. 
a customer, so a customer providing once an order, and environmental flows which support those customer journeys, things we need to do in order to provide our, to get our business able to support that. Right. So we actually have two customer-based flows, one for our restaurant customers and one for our people actually ordering from us. We didn't really have an environmental flow, although you could potentially consider your flow from the restaurant to be environmental. In other words, I set that up. But the clearer ones would be in, say, a hotel. You have an operational flow around check-in to check-out, what they call the guest life cycle. But there are loads of environmental flows to fill the minibar in your room, to change the linen and the laundry and stuff you don't directly interact with, but you expect to happen as part of your process, right? So you're looking for those handover steps in order to find the process groups. And those are what you really want to focus on, on modeling the domain of. And generally speaking, if it's a mature industry, uh, it will have understood those at one point before automation. And if you go and look for the documentation, you quite often find documentation for the manual process way of doing that that existed. Another question. Oops. Uh, thank you for that. It was all very interesting. Um, and in your a bit simplified, simplified version there, you've had a scenario where you had an async comms where of going from the order to the payment processing, but the user itself would have expected that to be a very synchronous and continuous experience. Yeah. yeah. And again, I know it's a simplified version, but how would flow-based programming handle that so for the user it still appears to be one single event? Yeah, uh, we didn't get into some of the uh, ways that effectively it, it looks to the user. So generally, from the user's point of view, I'm interacting with you somehow, like a UI, effectively, et cetera. Uh, and generally, what happens is I, I, I have uh, signals that go back over ports back to the UI, which present information to the user. So as they go through steps, what happens is a port would raise a signal, an event, if you like, which basically then creates a notification from the user's point of view on the UI that tells them what's going on. All right, I, it, there's three and a half minutes, and I, there's another talk straight after, so we've probably got time for one more question, and then you have to catch me after, or catch me on Twitter at iCooper. My DMs are always open, so feel free. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for the, uh, for the talk. Um, you're saying that uh, information flows, or state, state flows through this uh, components instead of them managing or the services managing the state, but your services, uh, they still have to manage certain state as well, I believe, like which customer base you have or maybe uh, a history of uh, previous payments or, or orders made by that uh, customer. So you still have state also managed by your services. How do you make the distinction? Where's sure. the line? In some cases you do. In, um, so, so there's a couple of different scenarios there to talk about. So one is things like historical information, right? So generally, a, a service that's dealing with a, pro, a transactional process doesn't need to store historical information. If the customer wants to know their order history, then another, uh, if you like, service can listen for, I would not think of it as a service though, much as a composite view model, listens effectively to the messages about orders being raised, accumulates them, builds up a database, and we wrap a, 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 an API over it that says, I want to query my order history. Right, so those kind of almost um, query stores uh, that really are, do just layer over entities do exist, but they are not the services that are the object of our modeling focus, right? They, just support, they support stuff. Um, so things like order history tend to basically be in there. Services may maintain state where effectively it's for resilience usually, right? There's a risk that my service goes down and I haven't finished work and I want to resume and pick up basically any work that was existing in flights. So we looked at that with, the, say, the fax or the um, uh, payment service that were effectively, we were saying, well, we can't effectively guarantee that we would um, not lose work if we act the message off the queue to say we're processing it, but it's long running, there's no real guarantee, right? So we, then, we, then we store stuff for resilience. Um, but generally in this model, you have lots of very... Uh, uh, data-focused analytical stores being built by listening to messages, often through a mesh or a lake, um, which is generating a, a lake with egress to generate specific stores. Um, so order history, et cetera, historical information tends to get picked up that way instead. All right, I'm over time now, so thank you very much. <clears throat>
enjoyed that one. Thank you. Thank you.